Again, I would like to thank those of you that are tuning in, uh, those that have tuned in on uh, multiple occasions, have enjoyed uh, the messages. Uh, we are located in Wilton, New Hampshire, Good News Bible Church on 27 Hutchinson Road, and we meet at 10 a.m. on Sundays, and we would love to have you come visit. If you do not have a church home, uh, please come and visit us and be blessed. Thank you. As we continue in our series in Philippians, we're in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. And each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. You see, in order to encourage unity within the church, Paul lists four incentives. The word if comes before the incentives. Not to question the truth of these incentives, but to show what happens when they are practiced by believers. The word, the wording is interpreted in the expanded translation by Kenneth Woost as follows. In view of the fact that there is a certain ground of appeal in Christ, which exhorts, since there is a certain tender persuasion that comes from divine love, in view of the fact that there is a certain partnership on the part of the Spirit, in which the Spirit gives us aid in the living of our Christian life, since there are certain tender heartedness and compassions, this is what we find in the expanded translation by Kevin Woost, Philippians 2, verse 1. We have encouragement from union with Christ. The scripture is filled with encouragement for believer. For the believer. When believers are in union with Christ, then encouragement flows from Scripture as the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, fills the heart and empowers the believer to run the race marked out for them and to finish the race, to keep up the good fight of faith. And this encouragement should overflow from believer to believer. But the encouragement comes from being in union with Christ. When you're in union with Christ, the overflow of that will be unity. Secondly, comfort nourished or nurtured from the love of Christ. Flowing from the love of Jesus is compassion and comfort. Believers, followers of Jesus, when in communion with the Lord, receive this comfort in many ways. Through the confirmation of his word, through the knowledge of God's presence in life circumstances, and through the comfort of other believers which they've received from God. In 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion in the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. Hebrews 4, 15, the author of Hebrews says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. So again, flowing from the love of Jesus is compassion and comfort. And when we're in communion as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, as disciples of Jesus Christ, then that love should flow from us. Confirmation of his word through the knowledge of, of God's presence in life circumstances, through the comfort of Christians that have received from God. This all comes together, or should come together, and it screams unity. Timothy 
teaches us unity. Thirdly, communion with the Holy Spirit. One of the promises a believer has concerning being found in Christ is to be able to boldly and with confidence approach the throne of grace. Whereas in the Old Testament, God spoke through fire and smoke and trumpet blasts and earthquakes and thunder and lightning from the top of Mount Sinai. People were commanded to worship at a distance. They were forbidden to even touch the mountain or they would die. It was a long distance relationship. New Testament believers under the new covenant, which was ratified in the blood of Christ, can approach the throne of grace Approach God with boldness, assurance, confidence, and without fear. And this is the result of possessing the communion with the Holy Spirit. And again, it goes back to our relationship with God. Everything is birthed out of our love for God and putting him first in our lives. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And fourth, outward affection of compassion. Outward affection of compassion. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, 4, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, in the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So it's, it's always an exchange. We receive from him and we give to others. We commune with him. We commune with others. We are encouraged by him. We encourage others. It's all about and all flows from our relationship with God. And I will say this a, a bazillion times over. Out of the overflow of our love for God comes our love for others, our ability to forgive others, our ability to encourage, our ability to, to experience His presence in our time of need, all of it. In fact, the existence of affection and of compassion, the existence and reality of tenderness, it's also exhibited as mercies. It should be the norm amongst the fellowship of believers. This should be the norm. The unity and love for each other within the fellowship of believers should be evident because true believers have all been filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized into one body, the universal body of Christ, the church, Christ's bride. Listen to this. Paul says to the church at Corinth, the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we are all baptized by one spirit into the body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were given, we were all given the one spirit to drink. All of us. So there should be unity. Why then? Why is there so much disunity? Why so much divisiveness? Listen to this. Number one on your outline. The comfort and nourishing of Christ's love should foster a cease and desist of divisiveness and promote love and unity in the body of Christ. The comfort and nurturing of Christ's love should foster a cease and desist of divisiveness and promote love and unity in the body of Christ. And looking ahead to chapter four, we, we can glean some insight as to why the first four verses of chapter two may have been written. There is a suggestion in this passage of some element of disunity in this little church at Philippi, this church that, that Paul loved, this church that he wrote letters to and just loved so much. In Philippians 2, 2 through 3, 
in the English Standard Version, he says, I entreat Yoda. And I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion. Paul is pleading here with these two women on the basis of their faith and unity with Christ to cultivate unity amongst each other. Apparently, Yodia and Syntyche were not getting along. Let me show you my shock face. They weren't getting along. The greatest motive for unity amongst believers is Jesus. And because a person is a believer, then a believer, a disciple, Christian unity should be evident amongst fellow Christians. It is obvious to us that the two women Paul mentions in chapter 4 were of admirable character. I mean, look at letter A. These two women were believers and co-laborers of Paul. He says, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Here's two women. Their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. But they weren't living in unity. But all of these people that Paul is mentioning, they, they, they've gone through hardship. The hardship of persecution. They were, they were worthy of mention and, and were singled out as being fellow laborers for Christ. They were engaged in the spiritual warfare and probably suffered hardship for the sake of the gospel. Remember that the Philippian church was birthed through much persecution. And these people were all engaged in ministry. But because they were not maintaining unity amongst themselves, they were in danger of damaging the church, of damaging the testimony of the church. Again, because they were not maintaining unity amongst themselves, they were in danger of damaging the church, its testimony. The NIV says, I plead with you. Eurodia, and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. The New American Standard says, I urge Eurodia and I urge uh, Syntyche to live in harmony within the Lord. And now I plead with these two women, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. We can only speculate as to the reason of their lack of unity. Could have been over some point of doctrine, but I believe theology is usually disagreed on by men. It could have been a, a difference of opinion concerning administrative practices or teaching. It could have been a difference of opinion on how to run a household or discipline children and so on. Or it could have been some action taken by the other or a careless word spoken in the heart or the heat of the moment. One of them could have said something about the other to others. But we know for sure there was a disagreement between the two of them and they were in danger of bringing a bad testimony upon the church. Note Paul's concern to reconcile the two women and what that entailed. First Paul pleads with the two women. Then Paul pleads with others. Not to choose sides, but to help these two women forgive and be reconciled. And the second thing can be uh, time-consuming and heartbreaking and downright dangerous. Number two, right here. Paul knew that possessing and maintaining godly unity is a testimony to the world. He says, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. John 13, 34 and 35, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, I just mean, want to make something crystal clear here. It's not just women that could be in odds with each other. I have watched over the years men 
become angry with one another to the point where they're, they're no longer friends and pretty soon they no longer come to the church. I've witnessed that. Paul, though, he knew the potential danger concerning, concerning these two women in the church at Philippi. Proverbs 17, 19, he who loves a quarrel loves sin. He who loves a quarrel loves sin. He who builds a high gate invites destruction. If I read that in the New Living Translation, paraphrase, anyone who loves to quarrel loves sin, and anyone who trusts in high walls invites disaster. You see, letter A, the church is a unity in diversity. We may, we're not going to all agree on everything. That's totally impossible because we have a sinful nature. And we have personality quirks, and, and, and it's just, that's just life. And unity does not mean uniformity. But people can agree to disagree, and that's okay. This side of heaven, we will not all agree on all things, and that is okay. You've got to be okay with that. But what I have often seen is that, number three right here, unity can be broken by bad communication. Unity can be broken by bad communication. Communication is, is the act of imparting, conferring, and delivering from one to another knowledge, opinions, and, and facts. And this brings us to letter A. Bad communication breeds bad feelings. As we dive deeper into this subject of sin and self-control, I, I want to bring to your attention something that causes more harm to the human race, and most people practice it on a daily basis. It happens when you believe something is true without any proof whatsoever. I call this the act of assumption. And we'll tackle it where it originated. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had, had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say? You must not eat from any tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat, from, eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. You see, when Satan tempted Eve, he got her to question the goodness of God. Did God really say? And then he said something else. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When I read this, I see Eve making the assumption that God is holding out on both her and her husband. It would be very easy for Eve to start assuming that God knows I can be like him. No wonder he forbids us to eat from the fruit of this tree. He knows we will be just like him. Why would God hold out on us? Why wouldn't he want us to be just like him? Now, the main part of the lie was planted by Satan, but I believe there was a whole lot of assuming going on in her thinking. She dwells on this until she believes her assumption. And when you dwell on what you are assuming long enough without any proof of truth, in that assumption, you can cross the line and believe your assumption. In essence, to believe in an assumption that is not true is to believe in a lie. And I watch this happen all the time. You assume it to be true, it's got to be true. This is what this person's thinking about me, or this is what they said. And it becomes your truth. In fact, you just fabricated your own truth through the act of assuming. And it happens all the time. People assume something about someone else. 
And instead of going to the person to find the proof of truth, they spend a ton of time brewing and assuming until what they assume about a certain person becomes their truth. And the problem is, is that their truth, most of the time, is a lie. What is worse, most people will go to others for support. They tell their perspective of the story, which to them is, is reality and truth. And they share it with others with a skewed perspective, which, by the way, may even contain a little bit of truth. But a half truth is still not a truth. And then they tell someone else and the circle becomes bigger as more people are brought into the assumptions. This is what Satan did in heaven. He peddled his lies. And angels assumed. They assumed the assumptions were true. That we can be above God. That we too can have a throne and it could be higher than God's. And before you know it, two sides have been formed. Enter the conflict that happens within marriage, family members, friends, co-workers, church members, church elders, even pastors. Think of the magnitude of what took place with Eve's assumption. It led her to make up her own truth about God and herself. And by believing and then acting on that assumption, she sinned against God. and her husband with her. Believing and acting on an assumption, on a lie, fellowship was broken with God and what followed was shame, guilt, disunity, blame, and a human fallen sinful nature that we watch played out every single day. It's no wonder Solomon said, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. I have watched as people have formed sides over the years, assumed things about others and then took action and build teams and they go at it. And the next thing you know, you've got people bolting out of fellowship, out of a church, mad, angry, in unity is broken. Adam and Eve chose to believe a lie, an assumption that they could be like God, their own God, and that there was another way to live life. And this all changed how they worship God. Does that so sound familiar? What is tragic is, is that active assumption becomes the basis of breaking fellowship with God and then with family. Notice how years later, the assuming continued in the family. Cain assumed he could worship the Lord as he saw fit. And that only led to anger associated with assuming. And then Cain became angry, so angry that he started hating his brother. And then he murdered him. I have witnessed the anger that's manifested in people who are in disunity with their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. I have seen the red faces, the finger pointing, the disdain, the contempt from believers against other believers. And I can tell right away, wow, they are not in unity with God the Father. Because what's flowing out of them isn't from God the Father. It's from the pits of hell and a sinful nature.
It's displayed in the faces and displayed in the actions, revealed in the words. And anger only magnifies and intenses a person's assumptions about another person. I know right now, some of you are probably thinking, well, I, I am not assuming that so-and-so did this and said that and, and, it, and it hurt. Well, the Bible says, forgive them. Don't be easily offended. Forgive as you have been forgiven. You see, number four, unity is broken by selfish ambition and conceit. Let nothing be done, Paul says, through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. The word strife is used in the King James Version. And the Greek word for that means faction, contention, a courting distinction, a, a desire to put oneself forward, a factious spirit, a self-seeking spirit, rivalry. Self-will being an underlying idea in the word, and it denotes party making and seeking to win followers through factions. Think about that. That's strife. Well, I'm going to make a team. And I'm going to share what I'm going through, and I'm going to share it with so-and-so, and I'm going to share it with so-and-so, and they'll believe me, and they'll be on my side. And boy, isn't it great? Doesn't it feel good when you've built a team that's backing you? All in the name of selfish ambition and conceit. Strife party making and seeking to win followers. In fact, letter A, faction is the fruit of jealousy and the causing of division. Vain glory, groundless self-esteem slash pride. And it all goes back to the garden. It all goes back to lending your ear to the devil, the father of lies, the murderer, the party maker. He won a following. And that following went to war in millions of angels lost their first estate, assuming that a lie was true. Pretty crazy. Paul says, I appeal to you brothers in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's, Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. And what I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Nothing's new, isn't it? <laughs> it's been said, without union, no church can be prosperous. This indeed is applicable to all societies, whether small or great. A divided family, how helpless. A divided kingdom, a kingdom distracted with rival factions, and where the, the general welfare is overlooked, how can it stand? Wow. Its internal feuds tempt its stronger neighbor to make war upon it, and the aggression succeeds. And with still greater emphasis does this hold good as regards to the church. In this sacred territory, no power is recognized except the law of love. And when this disappears, the Spirit of God has no choice but to depart. 
And when the spirit is thus grieved and flies from the scene of discord, who takes his place? Satan, who glories in dissension and who has no other pleasure than the dark and hateful one of vexing the church of Christ and of luring men's souls to perdition. Do you tell me we're not in a spiritual war? Absolutely. And I see it played out all the time in people that believe their assumptions are true. That's why we're told to keep short accounts. Get it straight. Go right to the source. How many times have we taken communion when, when deep down we, we have some disdain, some bitterness in our heart about somebody else, what they've said, what they've done? Or what we think they said, or what we think they've done. Either way, we're told to forgive. Why? Because Christians are delegated. Number five, Christians are delegated, commanded, delegated the responsibility of being stewards of unity. The very source of unity dwells within us. And we've been given, we've been delegated the responsibility of being stewards of this unity. Ephesians 4, 3, be diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And I will tell you one thing. This is probably one of the hardest things to do. Because relationships can be fragile. And it's not a part-time job. To be delegated the responsibility and the stewardship of unity. The New Living Translation says, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourself together with peace. The Revised Standard says, eager to maintain the unity. King James says, endeavoring to keep the unity to be prompt or earnest, to be diligent, to labor, to study, to exert oneself. The word to keep means to attend to carefully, to guard, to hold, to keep, to preserve, to watch. Notice that true unity already exists. There is nothing within this verse that says that Christians are to create unity because in Christ, unity already exists. Unity is not something we have to manufacture. Christians are spiritually united with Christ. We are to maintain it. We're to be good stewards of it. Romans 8, 16 and 17, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. The words at all times basically means that there are no exceptions. So the question here is, how can a person promote unity within their sphere of influence? And this leads us to number six. Unity is cultivated by possessing the mind of Christ, which exhibits humility. Interesting. Unity is cultivated by possessing the mind of Christ, which exhibits humility. Paul later, he goes on to tell this church at Philippi, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. C.S. Lewis says, pride is the mother hen under which all of the sins are hatched. And how did Jesus defeat the curse? Through humility. Through becoming one with what he created, the human. Harry Ironside, a well-known preacher and author, 
told a story of his struggle with humility. He sought out a friend who instructed him to make a sandwich board with the pl uh, plan of salvation and scripture on it and wear it as he walked through the business and shopping districts of the downtown Chicago for one entire day. Ironside did it and found it to be a humiliating experience. As he was taking the sandwich board off, however, he caught himself thinking, there's not another person in Chicago who would be willing to do a thing like that. <laughs> See, humility is essential to successful relationships and love and humility go together. You cannot have one without the other. Philippians 2, 7, King James Version, but made himself of no reputation. Our God, our creator, sent his son, perfect as he was, without sin as he was. Think about this, no reputation to make empty. Jesus stepped out of the balconies of heaven to identify with us and then die for us. Stamp of approval on that, the acceptance of it, that our sins would be forgiven because he became the atoning sacrifice was the resurrection, which we're gonna celebrate in a few weeks. But in order to get to that point where man could be saved and forgiven and transformed and brought into God's presence for eternity, it took humility and it took love. And Jesus did both perfectly. Jesus did not selfishly exploit his, his divinity, but by his own decision, emptied himself of it, laid it by the side, taking the form of a servant by becoming a man. The subject of this, you know, the, the incarnate, the pre-existent Lord became incarnate. There's a strong sense of unity. The essence remains. The mode of being changes. This is a genuine sacrifice. And he said, while he was on this earth, I see the Father working and I join him in that work. Jesus never did anything out of selfishness. Never used his divinity for himself. You see, the result of Christ's humility was his exaltation. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You get this? The subject of, of you know, not the incarnate, but the pre-existent Lord. This is a strong sense of the unity of his persons. The essence remains, the mode of being changes, which is a genuine sacrifice. He became man. To live for us, to die for us to become the sacrifice for us. And because of his humiliation, there was exaltation. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. No wonder James says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Peter says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. When Jesus humbled himself, he had the interests of the Father in mind, which included our salvation, our restoration, 
With this kind of attitude, a person dies to self in their right to get even, in their right to retaliate. And this kind of attitude promotes unity because it has the interests of others at heart. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Are you, are you making every effort to promote unity? Your family, amongst your friends, within this fellowship? Are you engaging in the act of assumption? Are you acting or reacting based on a half-truth? Or no proof of truth because you are assuming? Do you need to pray for wisdom and discernment because you may have fabricated your own truth by believing a lie about someone else? Are you angry? You see, the action you have to take is to prayerfully make things right. You go to the person or the persons and you ask for forgiveness. You grant forgiveness and you make every effort to restore and maintain the stewardship of unity. You see, being delegated the responsibility of being a steward of unity, that's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. So how are you doing with the charge of unity? Unity.